Blessings, blessings, blessings to my wonderful partners all over the world. I am so pleased to be with you again today, this Wednesday. Very important uh, teaching I'm doing now on can someone lose his or her salvation? This is a question that's been, you know, people have asked that same question for hundreds, if not even longer than that, years, I mean. And what does the Bible say about it? We, that's what we're looking at. And I'm going to wait till you all join me so I can say my hellos to you because I really enjoy seeing your names and saying hello. So, for some reason, I'm not seeing the video. I don't know why. Uh... Pardon? There we go. I see it now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And uh, anyways, let me just say my hellos to you. Our numbers have been so strong uh, with, this, with this teaching. I'm going to continue tomorrow, by the way, because I really want to talk about predestination. And then I'll probably finish on Friday to, to answer probably one of the most troubling questions. Uh, in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. You know, that, that's one of those things that we need the help of the Holy Spirit with. But I can tell you, I know the answer. That's been one of the most troubling uh, questions people have had. It says, if we sin willfully, there's no more place for repentance. That's a, that's a, a, a very, very scary one. But be at peace. All is well. I'm going to answer that on Friday. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about predestination uh, and what that means and where is the balance and so forth. First of all, hello to Elenita. Hello to Nicole and James. Hello to Kevin. Kevin Garrick said, Good day, man of God. Well, good day to you, Kevin. God bless you. Hello to Joseph from Dubai and Sunil. Hello to Ashraf. Hello to Juan from Atlanta. Kavita. Edgar. Carolyn. Manisha. And hello to Joy. Hello to Vivek. Well, a very powerful, very powerful day today as I minister on this most blessed word. Uh, the election was held here yesterday in the United States. We still don't know who the winner is. So pray for this country, will you please, that the Lord will have his way. Wonderful Lord, now I do pray that you will give your people clear a clear understanding of this beautiful truth in your word. And Lord, let them see it clearly without any questions or confusions remaining in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. You know, when, when you talk about can one lose his salvation, you have millions of Christians who say no, and just as many who say yes. So what does the Bible say? Well, let's look at John chapter 10 one more time. I'm going to read verse 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So these are the uh, two verses that people use who believe in once saved, always saved. Uh, they use this and others like them, but these are like the main headlines. And I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, let, let, let me just explain one more time what I said yesterday. People who believe this don't have a clear understanding of the fact that eternal life is connected to the one 
who is eternal life. In other words, God does not give you a piece of it in your heart or a part of it in your heart. He is life. He is life. So as long as we are united to him, then that life flows in us and through us. We cannot have life apart from the Son of God. It's impossible. So when we say we have life eternal, the truth is we don't have a part of it in us. We are connected to the Lord who is life eternal. He is eternal life. I've, you know, I've always said, um, God does not live in eternity. Eternity lives in him. He, he, he is eternity. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the alpha. He is the omega. So the Lord Jesus said, I am. He did not say, I have life. He said, I am life. So as long as the Lord is in your heart and my heart, that life will be there. Now, our responsibility, this is where we have to bring the balance. I believe in predestination with all of my heart, and tomorrow I'll be talking more about it, that I think you'll, you'll probably enjoy a lot, because there is really balance, and the balance is quite simple. I did not find Jesus, you did not find Jesus, he found you, he found me. He convicted us, we did not convict ourselves. We could not have found God even if we could have. Like, how can you find God? I remember uh, one fellow I knew here in Florida who was looking for God, so he went to, to Tibet looking for God. Well, you can't find God as a human being. I mean, where, where would you go to find him, you know? And I can tell you, he didn't find him either. He went to Tibet and wasted his time and money. He found you. He found me. That's why predestination is in the Bible, that God chose you and chose me before the foundation of the world. He, he wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world, it says in Revelation 13 and 1 Peter chapter 1. So it's quite clear that our salvation was done and complete before the foundation of the world. Now, does this mean we have no responsibility? No, we do have a responsibility. What is it? It's verse 27. This is where the balance comes. If you look at John 10, 28, 29, very comforting verses. I give them life eternal. They'll never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. I love it. Beautiful. But what's my responsibility? Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So you and I have to follow the Lord to have that life eternal in us. So the necessity of following the Lord is mentioned also in John chapter 8 and verse 12. And I think this is where the balance comes in. Then speak Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So when we choose to follow, now some will say, well, God puts it in you. Listen, there's a lot of scriptures that say one thing and many that say the other thing. We have to find the balance. Yes, God does convict us. Yes, God draws us to himself. He still gives us the choice to cooperate to follow, because we, we don't see anywhere in the Bible where the Lord is pulling us, or pushing us, or forcing us. No, we have the choice to follow or not follow. And, and I'll explain more tomorrow, so you know, don't give up on me, because there is the fact that, yes, yeah, some are not chosen to life eternal. That's a very, very troubling one too. 
It says so in the word of God very, very, very clearly. Uh, and I'll deal with more of that tomorrow. And that's where predestination becomes somewhat difficult. But, you know, there's answers for everything in God's word, to be honest with you. It's all there. But we'll deal with that tomorrow. So, the faith on which our union with Jesus depends on, please hear these words, the faith on which our union with the Lord Jesus depends on is not an act of some past moment of repentance. It's a living faith, lived every moment with the living Savior. Can I say it again? Okay. The faith that keeps me united to the Lord is not dependent on a past moment when I repented. It's a, it's a living faith. It's a moment-by-moment -moment faith. It's a fellowship with the Lord that goes on daily, hourly, every minute in my life and your life. So Paul the Apostle dealt with that in Colossians chapter 1. Now remember, this is given to the predestined, to the elect. Because there are those who are not elect. We'll deal with that tomorrow. I just want to make sure that you understand. I cannot give it all to you in one day. There is no doubt in my heart and life that some people are chosen to life eternal and some are not. It's clear in the Bible. Clear in the Bible. He chose us in him before the foundation of, of the world, yet others were not chosen. That's why someone can go to a service and listen to the gospel, and you might as well be talking to a rock or to a tree or to a wall because they don't get it. They just don't get it. I have cousins and second cousins, many cousins that live in Canada who've been to my crusades. You know, when, when, when they sit there and they've been to my own meetings, it's like you might as well be talking to a, to a dead person. They didn't get it. One time they came to say hello to me and they fell under the power of God and not one of them said, what was that power? All they said is, hi Ben, how are you doing? I mean, I was in shock. How can anyone fall under the power of God and not even ask, what, what was this power that knocked me out? Why did I fall? It's just like those people in the Garden of Gethsemane who fell when the Lord said, I am, and no one said, what was that power? That's blinded by the devil, you see? So... It says that the evil one has blinded the minds of them that believe not. So we'll talk about all that tomorrow, but let's deal with what we are dealing with now. So we have a responsibility, even as the elect, to follow, to obey, to say, yes, Lord. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, and that's why there's a lot of controversy with this. There's a lot of questions of, which one is it? Well, the Bible has all, all the answers. Colossians 1, 21, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith. So someone says, you know, it says in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm chosen in, in it before the foundation of the world. Okay, well, Paul said the same. Blameless before him in love. It's all in, in Ephesians 1. But here it says clearly, it's, it's, it's still you have a responsibility to follow, to continue in the faith. So Paul says that in the body of his flesh through, through death to present your holy unblameable, unreprovable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved, I'm reading Colossians 1, 23, 
if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you've heard. So that's my responsibility, that I'm not going to walk away. I'm not going to say, no, Lord, I don't want to hear it no more. Does, does not, the Lord does not force his salvation on anyone. So, the Bible is very clear. Now, let's go to 1 John, 1 John, chapter 3. And I'm going to look at verse 9. And we're going to deal now with another matter, still with the same subject. Those who truly follow the Lord are those who are born of God. And the Bible says in 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Okay, now, what does he mean by cannot sin? What does it mean by that he cannot sin? It says, whoever is born of God does not commit sin because his seed remains in him, for he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's created a lot of confusion and questions too. All right. Certainly, it does not mean he cannot commit sin because this was co would, would contradict 1 John chapter 1, 8 through chapter 2. So let's just read it here. 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. So 1 John 3, 9 says, He that is born of God cannot commit sin because his seed is in him. And then it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful, he's just, to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Watch what it says now. My little children. 1 John 2 verse 1, because it was all one letter. There were no chapters back then. My little children, these things write, write I unto you that, you that you sin not. Well, he can't be saying that and then he says in, you know, 1 John 3, well, no one can sin if you're born of God. He says, my little children, these things I say to you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation of our sins, not only of ours, but of the sins of the whole world. So, you know, you say, well, you know, there's a, con a contradiction. No, no, there's no contradiction at all. No contradiction if you understand 1 John 3. Now, in 1 John 3, let's go to it now. It's very important. Verse 6. Let's look at verse 6 and verse 9. I hope you're enjoying this. Are you enjoying this chat and learning anything? Let's look at verse 6. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. So, it says very clearly here, if we abide, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, if we confess our sin, it's faithful and just. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us. But here it is. Here is the balance. When we walk with the Lord, when we abide in Him, when His Word abides in us, we walk in righteousness. Now, it doesn't mean we're not going to sin because it contradicts what I just said in 1 John 1, 2. Okay? So what does he mean by, what does he mean by he cannot sin in verse 9? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. His seed remains in him. He cannot sin. He cannot sin willfully. Listen here. It's quite simple. Every one of us falls into sin because we're weak. But when we abide in the Lord and when his word is in us, that's what it means by the seed is in him. One more time. His seed remaineth in him. What is the seed that's remaining in us? The word. What is the seed? It's the word. So here's, here's, here's the answer. We all are weak. We all fail. We all fall. But... When we abide in the Lord, like verse 6 says, that we abide, whosoever abides, okay, if, the, if, if your seed is in you, 
then you will not sin willfully. So there's two groups here. One, we all sin because we're weak. Two, if we abide in the Lord and His Word is in us, we will not sin willfully. Willfully. In other words, no one, no real Christian will say, tomorrow I'm going to lie. Tomorrow I'm going to steal. We cannot plan sin. And something else that's important. To be born again, to be born of God, is to abide. And by the way, that's, it's, it's the same thing. To be born of God and abide are the same thing. So, you cannot be born again and be born of God if you're not abiding in Christ Jesus. He's the vine, we're the branch. And the branch does nothing except connect. We're connected to the vine. We abide in the vine. He lives his life, his life through us. And to abide means to remain, to continue, to endure, to tarry, to dwell. So abiding in Jesus is more than fellowship, way more than fellowship. Abiding in, in the Lord is the life itself. Life itself. Remaining in him, who is our life. We remain in him who is our life. That's what it means to abide. Now, before we finish, we have to understand what is meant by the seed remains in him. Luke 8, 11 says, the word is the seed. The word is the seed. And Psalm 119, 11 says, if, my, if your word abides in me, I will not sin, I'll not sin against you. If your, if your blessed word is hidden in my heart, I'll not sin against you, Lord. That's what the Bible says. But what does it mean by I'll not sin, sin against you? Willfully. And I love this verse because it's so precious. And many Christians have sadly misunderstood this verse in Psalm 119 and verse 11. And we're going to read it together, and you all know it by heart, I'm sure. Thy word have I hidden my heart. So that's my, that's my responsibility. Thy word have I hidden my heart. God did not force his word in me. I received it. That I might not sin willfully against thee. Do you see the difference between sinning because we're weak and sinning willfully? Tomorrow I'm going to talk about a little more that is so intriguing and so uh, powerful. In fact, you know, you know what I'll do? I will deal tomorrow with Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. I think it's so important to understand these uh, portions of the word. If we sin willfully, there's no place for repentance. What does it mean to sin willfully? Did David sin willfully when he looked at Bathsheba? and told Joab to kill her husband? Tomorrow. <laughs> we'll talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to let, let the Lord lead me with tomorrow. Whether I, I, I talk about that or whether I talk about predestination, I'm going I'm to let the Holy Spirit tell me which way to go. So you just join me tomorrow. Now, I want to pray with you. I want to pray that the Lord will really give you clarity You'll get to know his word. You know, I was troubled too when I was young by a lot of scriptures I could not understand. But, you know, all these years have passed now. I got saved in 1972, February 14, 7.50 in the morning on a Monday morning in high school. That's a long time. And I've learned a lot from the Holy Spirit for, through the word. So today, I no longer am troubled by scripture because now I've come to a place in my life where I really know blessed assurance Jesus is mine peace, peace, wonderful peace I want you to know the same thing that blessed assurance Father I pray in the sweetest most wonderful name of Jesus your son Lord, give them that blessed assurance, that wonderful peace from heaven. 
They'll never ever question their salvation. Never question whether they are forgiven and loved and accepted in the beloved. Oh, sweet, sweet Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. We give you the praise. Sweet Lord Jesus, I give you the praise. Hallelujah. And Lord, I pray today, bless them. In every way, bless them. Bless them financially, Lord, to secure their tomorrow. Financially, I pray a wonderful Redeemer. I give you the praise. Amen. I have, you know, I've been believing God to give you property. I just have felt faith for that the last few days. And I want to continue today praying that God would bless you and secure your future. You know, the world today is troubled. People are worried. People are afraid of tomorrow, what tomorrow may bring. We have the promise of God, you see. And Jesus promised us property and homes. He didn't say, uh, I'm going to give you money or gold and silver because all of that is in the property. It's, it's already in the land. But he did promise when, they, when Peter said, Lord, we have left all to follow you. He said, no one who has left family and so forth and so forth will not receive in this life a hundredfold with persecution. And then he added property and land, houses and land. So since the Lord promised it, we have the right to ask for it. We have the right to believe for it. So Lord, in Jesus' name, come on, believe God with me. Because this is for your, for your future, financial future. Lord, in Jesus' name, give them that blessedness, Lord. Let them know in their hearts this belongs to them, Lord. A house or a condo or, Lord, that they pay off their house or condo and buy other homes and condos so they can rent them out and be blessed in their tomorrow and property and land in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Now, how does that happen? When we give, we tell the Lord, Lord, you can trust me with it now. So every time I give, I'm saying, Lord, you can trust me because I'm a giver. God cannot trust anyone who is not giving. And what did Jesus say? If you cannot be trusted with filthy mammon, who will give you true riches? So. When we give, we say, Lord, you can trust me. So let's do it now. Let's sow that seed now into the Lord's work. Been here in ministries. You can do it online. You can do it on the platform you're watching me on or the network you're watching me on right now. Okay, the, the information is on the screen right here for you right now. Or you can go to benhinministries.org or you can text it. It's so simple. BHM 45777. So do it now and watch what God will do with your finances. He loves you. And join BHI. You're missing out if you're not a part of the Bible school I started a few months ago. It's closing in now on 2,000 students. And I want, it, I want you to be one of them. And we have class tomorrow again on Thursday. 